All right. What I want to go over today is sequences of operation and wiring schematics. Um, we are going to focus on one thing at a time. So I'm going to probably split this up to in at least three, if not four, um, videos on the subject. Um, we're going to go through AC only operation first and the schematic that goes with that. Once we've got that down, we'll move on to heat pumps and cooling, then heat pumps and heating, and then a furnace schematic. So important note, as you can see right now, I have a, um, a web browser pulled up showing a search for HVAC wiring symbols. That is because we're not going to go over wiring symbols. If you've never had a lecture on different wiring symbols and what they mean, then I highly suggest you do a Google search for HVAC wiring symbols and look at some of the different images available so that you can get a good idea of what the different ones are. So you can see here, I can just pull one of these up. We'll click on it. And we have a good representation of a lot of the different uh, switches and stuff that you'll see. And these might not be the same on all wiring schematics. They're definitely not going to be the same, but they're good representations. And you can click through a bunch of different ones and see some different options. Uh, alternatively, you can look in textbooks or something like that and get a good idea of all the different wiring symbols. Um, maybe at some point I'll put a course up on wiring symbols, but for the time being, I'm going to assume this is something you're already aware of. What I will do is when we start going over the wiring schematic, I will um, tell you which each, what each symbol shows. Uh, that way you're at least familiar with all the ones on the schematics that we are looking at. And they're going to be some of the most common ones and some of the more common ways that they are shown. But you're still going to have to learn from different manufacturers what their symbols typically look like. Once you get used to wiring schematics, you can kind of tell what they're trying to show with different symbols. You don't always have to, uh, you know, look it up. You can kind of get an idea of what they're trying to show. And every manufacturer's different carriers looks a little different from trains, which looks a little different from Lennox, which looks a little different from York, and so on and so forth. But they're all similar enough that you should generally get the idea. But you really need to um, at least have a good grasp of what you're looking at. So if you're unsure of some of the symbols I use, I use some pretty common uh, representations of those symbols. So you should look those up and get a good idea. But uh, that is uh, priority number one, is to try and get familiar with some of the different uh, wiring symbols and what they mean. So um, with that in mind, we're going to jump right into an AC sequence of operation. All right, so a typical air conditioner sequence of operation, it's not complicated at all. Okay, but it's a good thing to get kind of get your grasp on what you're what you're doing and then you can go into heat pumps which gets a little bit more complicated and then a uh, furnace circuit board is is a pretty long sequence of operation really um most of these schematics are going to be typical of split systems and small package units getting to larger units the sequences of operation change but this is what we're trying to prepare you for is okay if you can understand the sequences of operation for simple equipment then you know it, it's going to be easier to start to grasp what your sequence of operations should be for bigger equipment and maybe we can even uh, go over like a commercial RTU at some point and the sequence of operation for that um, a large one you know like 40 50 tons you know not super large but a pretty big one you know, something along those lines on a VAV system. We can talk about those in the future. But for the time being, I want you to be familiar with a typical sequence of operation for some regular residential equipment so that you know what you're looking for while you're trying to troubleshoot. 
Because the idea is that we learn the sequences of operation, then we learn to troubleshoot the individual components, we learn the wiring schematics, um, and then we're prepared to troubleshoot. So uh, it's usually easier if you understand the sequence of operation first, because then you know what should be happening and isn't. And based on what isn't happening, you know where you should be going to troubleshoot. Um, but first things first, you have normal preconditions of operation, and this is always the same across the board, right? You got to have high voltage to your indoor and outdoor unit or to the package unit for that matter. But again, we're going to be going over residential split systems right now, basically, right? So high voltage to indoor outdoor unit at proper voltage. You need high voltage fuses and uh, good or breakers closed. You need power to low voltage control transformers, low voltage output at plus or minus 10% of rating. Your high voltage has to be plus or minus 10% of rating too. Outside of those ranges, things aren't going to operate properly. Your low fuel voltage fuses and breakers need to be closed. Your power and control wires have to be properly terminated and in good condition. If either of those aren't true, things might not operate properly. And any external or auxiliary safeties are in closed position. When we look at a sequence of operation, it's not going to include things that the people added after they installed the equipment. So your float switches, your duct smoke detectors, um, uh, your you know easy trap switches, whatever the case may be, that's not going to be in the manufacturer sequence of operation. And if they are in the open position, cutting off power to your thermostat or to your you know your uh, outdoor contactor power wire, your yellow wire, okay, then things aren't going to operate. So it's important to double check all those things first. Now, um, before we get too far in that, I will tell you that typically one of the first things I'll do, let's just skip to the schematic for a second. All right. <clears throat> Skipping to the schematic for a, se a second, one of the first things I'll do is test 24 volts at the transformer or at RNC on my thermostat or my indoor unit. We're going to look at this again in a minute, but 24 volts, if I have 24 volts at RNC, okay, what that typically will tell you is that we have high voltage coming in, we've got fuses for high voltage are good, we got low voltage coming in, fuses for low voltage is good, so if that's the case, then we know we are in pretty good shape on almost all of these. Still might not tell you, depending on how they're wired, if any external auxiliary safeties are in closed position, and it may not tell you if the wires are properly terminated or in good condition because you could have issues as those things start to draw power. But it does tell you your high voltage is good, your high voltage fuses are good, your low voltage is good, and your low voltage fuses are good. And if you're getting plus or minus 10% on your low voltage, you should theoretically have plus or minus 10% on your high voltage too. So that's the quickest way to check those first four items. If you've got good low voltage, then you should generally have good high voltage. The exception being three-phase power, you could uh, be, be out of a, one of the phases, but the two phases that feed your low voltage transformer are good and then the other one's out, so that's something to keep in mind when you get to three-phase, but for residential single-phase equipment, if you've got low voltage, then you've got high voltage, and you know you've got it at the indoor unit. Uh, doesn't tell you if your stuff is good at the outdoor unit, but it tells you you're sending all your signals, so now you just got to double-check high voltage at the outdoor unit. So just something to keep in mind. It skips some steps. You know, if you don't have low voltage there, then you can go back and check uh, your high voltage is that coming in and if that is coming in and you can troubleshoot other places but that's the quickest way to check those first four items and be pretty confident that most of it's good it's not going to give you a hundred percent but any reading might not tell you a hundred percent for sure what's going on so but it's a 90 90 percent of cases you'll be good with that long diatribe out of the way let's talk about the sequence real quick so let's look at a typical air conditioner sequence of operation. One thing to keep in mind is the sequence assumes typical mechanical or electronic thermostat on non-communicating equipment. 
Um, we're not talking anything as far as uh, communicating equipment. We're talking about as simple as it gets, just uh, straight AC, most likely residential split system. All right. The thermostat has a integral time delay or compressor protection. The system has just been powered on or has recently been powered. Uh, you'll have a five minute delay timer. It could be three, it could be five, uh, but that'll count down before anything operates. All right, 24 volts is sent from the indoor unit to the thermostat, and inside the thermostat, 24 volts is sent to R and G, or R to Y and G on the thermostat. Um, depending on how the thermostat set, that power gets to Y and G different ways. But either way, as soon as that, uh, as soon as that system is in cooling, uh, and it's calling for cooling, there's going to be 24 volts on Y and 24 volts on G. Y sends 24 volts to the outdoor contactor. The outdoor contactor coil is energized, and the contacts close, sending power to the outdoor fan motor and the compressor. So the outdoor fan motor and the compressor begin to run assuming all, all the uh, components are operational. G sends 24 volts to the indoor fan relay. That causes the indoor fan relay coil to be energized and the contacts close, delivering power to the indoor fan blower, assuming all the components operate properly. System runs in cooling until the temperature drops to the thermostat set point. Once the thermostat reaches its set point and it opens the contacts 24 volts is no, no longer sent to y and g on the thermostat the outdoor contactor cool is de-energized and the outdoor contacts open removing power from the fan motor and the compressor the indoor fan relay is de-energized if the system is in auto and the indoor fan relay contacts open removing power from the indoor fan blower so now that we have that straightened out let's look at the schematic all right so All right, looking at the typical AC control schematic here, one thing that we can see first right off the bat is that we have a little legend here, and that'll be typical of all wiring schematics. This legend is going to tell you the abbreviations used in the schematic. Sometimes it won't tell you all of the abbreviations, but generally, it'll tell you most of the ones that are relevant to that particular schematic. Um, so we have C1 is the compressor contactor. FR is the fan relay. Compressor, comp is compressor. OFM is the outdoor fan motor. IFM is the indoor fan motor. IOL is the internal overload. XFMR is transformer. All right. One thing to note is anytime you have a contactor or a relay or even a sequencer, a lot of the times... The way they're labeled generally on wiring schematics means that you'll have a C1 coil and at least a C1 set of contacts. So I really want to look at the uh, air handler first, but just to look at this real fast. Or no, we can look at the fan relay, right? So we have F FR fan relay, right? On the FR fan relay, we can see that FR fan relay we have an FR coil. This is what powers the contacts. And then we have an FR set of contacts. That's what closes if this relay is energized. Right now, this is a normally open set of contacts. If this coil is energized, the FR contacts will close. If these were closed, normally set of contacts, then if this FR relay was powered, these contacts would open. Now, some manufacturers will label the contacts and the coil differently, but for the most part, the um, they'll be labeled with the same uh, abbreviation. So, now that we got that out of the way, we can look at the schematic itself. We have L1, L2 coming in. We can see on this particular air handler, L1 comes in does not have a set of contacts at all on it. So L1 goes directly over to um, one side of the blower motor. We have the blower motor here. Okay, IFM indoor fan motor. 
So L1 comes over there and it was always powering one side of the transformer. L2 comes in, it immediately splits off and powers the other side of the transformer. So in this particular schematic, this transformer should be powered anytime there's power on L1 and L2 for the uh, air handler. L2 continues on and connects to one side of a normally open set of contacts, which is our fan relay, which is connected to high speed on our indoor fan motor. So on the indoor fan motor, we can see this is a multi-speed blower motor. This right here is our capacitor. It is not labeled. Sometimes it'll be labeled C, cap, something like that. I've chosen not to label the capacitors. This is a very, this is pretty much your only symbol for capacitor. It's widely used in electronics and HVAC. So this is your symbol for the capacitor. Um, so that one you should remember, the little curved line with the straight line. You should know that that's always a capacitor. We show our start winding on the motor. We show our run winding on the motor on all of our speed taps. We'll talk about these motors a little bit more uh, when we talk about troubleshooting individual components, but understand that low speed connects to the longest part of the winding, so that uses the full winding of a multi-tap motor. Medium low, a little less. Medium high, a little less. And high is always the shortest winding. So these are just taps right off of one big winding in the blower. We have an internal overload in here. And then we can see our start winding. The start winding is made smaller and longer because your start winding is always a higher resistance than your run winding. And those are uh, connected in parallel with the capacitor. Um, it's interesting to note that your overload is generally on your speed tap. And the way this actually works out is the winding goes up through the overload and then continues through the rest of your winding. So if you weren't using high speed, if you're using medium high, it still has to go through that overload to continue on to the, uh, the rest of the circuit. So that's how the overload stays connected in a multi-speed motor. motor. Um, so there's our fan relay set of contacts our blower motor and our transformer. I show a little tap here because usually these uh, transformers will be tapped for 208, which uses less of the winding than if it's for 240, where it uses a longer winding on the transformer. And then we would have 24 volts out of this transformer. The 24 volts you have common, goes to a common connection on the, uh, if there is one somewhere inside the air handler, this one is showing a terminal board with R, G, Y, W, and C available on the terminal board. Um, common continues over to one side of the fan relay. And then R, 24 volts hot, goes out to the rest of the system. And then, of course, we show a ground lug in here that would need to be tied on in the system. So this is all there is to the air handler, and that's all there really needs to be to the air handler. All you really need is something to power the fan off or on, the transformer, and the other part of what powers it off and on, this one little relay. So moving over, we can go to the thermostat real quick. Thermostat R goes to the thermostat, goes to one side of the fan auto on switch. So this is currently placed in the auto position. This would be the on position if it was powered on. So you have power that immediately goes to that. So you can have the fan on or off. And then you have an auto or off switch generally, right? So if you have the system on auto, whatever you have it set to, heat or cool, it'll automatically work in heat or cool wherever it's set. Um, currently we're on the on position. We move over. This is your heat cool switch right here. So I'll just highlight that little portion of it for a second. That is your heat cool switch. So uh, that's what's going to select whether you are in heat or whether you are in cooling. All right. Um, 
if we are in heating, which is the current position it's in, it'll go through a heat thermostat and over to W. We don't even have heat on this system. So this is basically just there for nothing. Okay. Um, but a heating thermostat looks like this. The symbol for it will generally look something like this. This is normally open, closes on a fall. So if the temperature drops, then this this it will power this W terminal. If it is as the temperature rises, it will open and cut power to the W terminal. If we move this over to cooling, we go through a cooling thermostat. The cooling thermostat right here closes on a rise in temperature. So as the temperature goes up, this thermostat closes, powers this Y circuit, and as the temperature drops, then it will open and remove power from the Y circuit. So if it goes into cooling, you can see internally on this thermostat, this auto on switch. If you have the fan in auto, then power when it is sent to Y will also be jumped up to G. It's also interestingly on a lot of older thermostats why if you jump power from R to G and this thermostat is in auto, then you will also power cooling, right? If you jump from R to G at your air handler, you will send power to G on the thermostat, back feed power into Y, and then send power up to your outdoor unit. So if you've ever had that happen, if you, you've ever heard of somebody have that happen, that's because internally these things are connected. Even some electronic thermostats are set up like this because electronic thermostats still have relays inside of them. Okay, Everything is powered on and off through relays, essentially. So even on a complicated electronic thermostat, depending on how they choose to set up this circuit uh, you know, through the electronic controller, um, it's still going to backfeed power if you jump R to G somewhere. So anyway, um, so Y goes out, powers G. If it's an auto, if it's an on, G is already going to be powered because it's just going to straight go 24 volts straight to G, so it doesn't matter either way. goes to the Y terminal. Common is on the thermostat generally just to power it. A thermostat doesn't need common connected if um, it's powered by batteries or it's mechanical but it's generally a good practice to have common there unless you know you just don't want it or need it. Um, but try and at least leave a wire for it in case the next thermostat needs it. So anyway, common and Y go up to the outdoor unit. And in this outdoor unit, you can see that, you know, in a typical outdoor AC unit, it only powers one coil. The only reason you got those two wires going out there is to power one coil. Sometimes there'll be high and low pressure switches in the outdoor unit, sometimes there won't. But your simple, simplest outside condensing unit just has one contactor, and that's the compressor contactor, as we commonly call it, but it's really the contactor that sends power to the outdoor fan motor, OFM, and the compressor. So anyway, uh, going up here, we see our high voltage comes in, through both uh, L1 and L2 go through a set of contacts. So this would be a double pole contactor, right? We have two sets of contacts in our contactor, making it a two pole or a double pole contactor. Um, you can obviously have some units have a single pole contactor that just has a shunt right through the other side. So one side's powered all the time. That's fine too. Um, but I thought we would show a two pole contactor. So we can have a two-pole contactor here, and this is what we have in this case. L1 goes over to one side of the compressor and one side of the outdoor fan motor, which is where the internal overload is in this case. L2 powers the run winding to the, both the outdoor fan motor and the compressor, and it also goes to the common side of your uh, cap uh, dual capacitor. So that's what we're showing right here. We're showing our dual capacitor. And uh, either way, all three of these windings, or bo sorry, both of these windings and the common side of the capacitor is going to be powered by one side of the uh, incoming power. In this case, 240 volts L1, L2. Okay, um, we can see again we have a run winding in each one and a start winding. The start winding is 
longer because it is of higher resistance than the run winding. Off the start winding of the outdoor fan motor, this wire would normally be brown, right? Um, and that's going to power go to the F terminal, the fan terminal on your dual cap. Uh, this start winding is going to go to the H terminal, Herm terminal on the dual capacitor. And uh, I think carriers are purple. It doesn't really matter. It'll be of whatever specific color it is for that compressor. That'll go to the H terminal so that the start windings are powered through the capacitor. Okay. And that's how all that circuit's led, uh, designed. So there's pretty good detail in how everything works here so that you can get a grasp of what happens when. You know, what happens uh, when all these things are tied together. Now, both this fan motor and this compressor are shown in a three-wire configuration on the uh, capacitor. Uh, the the uh, indoor fan motor, this would be a four-wire configuration. And I've even colored these ones. So this would be your brown wire going to one side of the capacitor. This would be your brown and white side going to the other side of the capacitor. So um, notice that the brown and white is just tied on to your common, which a lot of times with blowers is the white wire. It could be yellow. But these are both just two, wire, two wires tied together. So you could just wire this in three wire. And I'm sure you've seen it before if you worked on condenser fan motors that are three wire four wire you know other blowers doesn't matter it can any any motor can be wired three wire or four wire which just means you either have that extra brown and white wire or you don't either way it's just jump to your common wire on the unit so that's a little uh tangent there so anyway that's the complete circuit you have we have our air handler we have our thermostat and we have our condensing unit so Let's look at what happens when we power these circuits. All right, so here we have schematic in which I've highlighted when everything's powered, what happens. So we have L1 is always powered. I didn't highlight anything that's always powered. It's not really uh, important to look at that. I want to see where power flows where it doesn't normally when the circuit's energized. So actually, let's start at the thermostat. Um, power's obviously coming from a transformer through R and then R to our thermostat. Power goes through R in the thermostat, down through the cooling switch, if this sets to cooling. So through your auto on switch, auto off switch, which is an auto, comes down, heat and cool switch, which is set and cool, goes up, goes through a cooling thermostat, which would be closed, even though I'm still showing it normally open. This would be closed, obviously, if we're sending power. It would continue on to our auto on switch of our fan, which is currently in auto. So power would be sent to Y and G that way. Um, y would go through. If there's a Y contact on your air handler, that would receive power, even though that does nothing. All right. If G goes to our air handler, and powers our fan relay. If this fan relay powered, power is going to flow through L2, and this set of contacts is now going to be closed. So this well, set of contacts, this contact this on this fan relay will be closed, which is going to send power to the high speed of this fan motor, and this fan motor will run. Assuming all the windings are in good condition, this fan motor would be running. For off of Y, it comes up, to our outdoor unit powers the C1 contactor coil. That C1 contactor coil closes both these sets of contacts, so power goes through L1 to one side of the outdoor fan motor and L2 or uh, and the compressor and L2 to the compressor and the outdoor fan motor and these motors will run if uh, if everything's operational with them. That's all there is to an AC only circuit. 24 volts is sent to thermostat. Power goes through the thermostat to the cooling switch. Powers G and Y. Y powers outdoor condensing unit. It runs. G powers fan relay. Fan runs. When it's done, all of these shut off. And we go back to our normal state, which is right here. And that's all there is to it. So, 
I know I went on a couple tangents there, and there was a lot to look at. Um, like I said, I tried to put a reasonable amount of detail in these. Um, again, we'll probably talk about it again when we go through motors, but this is actually how, you know, your multi-speed motors are generally wired and what you can expect on the terminals. And we talk about, you know, how to measure the windings. These are the wires you would pick so that you can measure the different sections of the windings. Same thing with the compressor. This is generally where most of the things are located and, um, how much resistance you can expect from the windings as far as relative. You know what I mean? Starts always more resistance than run. You know, high is always less resistance than low. Um, these are, the only thing I didn't do was color all of them because obviously different manufacturers can have different colors for some of this stuff. But I wanted to give you a good picture of what actually occurs and what closes and opens to make these things work. So, Again, this is a simple one, and the next one what we'll do is we'll go over heat pump sequence of operation and cooling because it's a little different, and we'll look at the schematic for that. Thanks.